Tonight, we are very, very lucky to have our guest here, Dr. Sadie Ryan from Glasgow University. <coughs> and Sadie's a linguist. And she's here, well, well, we're going to find out why she's here. She's going to give us a talk. So Sadie, <coughs> her background, she grew up in Edinburgh. She's lived in Glasgow for a long time. You will hear that she has a mixed Edinburgh-Glasgow accent. I want you to pay attention to accents tonight, because that's what she's going to talk about. She's going to talk about accents and how this influences people's identity or people express their identity through accents. Uh, I've got an odd accent. I spent most of my life in America. So sometimes I speak American, sometimes I speak Scottish. Sometimes I don't know what I am. I'm hoping you'll find out tonight. So, uh, Sadie, how about I just hand over to you? Great, thank you. Thanks Super. It's a lovely introduction. And thanks everybody for coming here tonight. This is amazing. I wish that a lot of the lectures I taught at the university were as well. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I'm really pleased to have you all here to be geeky about language with me and be curious about language. Um, so I've called the talk today Pure Deed Brilliant and there might be people already who are sitting there like that, that doesn't sound right. Um, so my first question for you guys and feel free to just, just shout out answers or put your hands up if you would like. Um, what's wrong with this sign? It's in Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> it is from Glasgow. So. I have to, I should um, wear my cards card in my chest and say most of my research so far has been in Glasgow. I'm actually just starting to kind of spread my wings a bit and go around the rest of Scotland a little bit more. Um, but yes, this is a place in Glasgow um, and it's called Pure Deed Vegan. And I want to say something about the, the, the title, the word in there. Sure. Deed, what about deed? Vegans don't, right, so <laughs> vegans don't eat meat, so nobody eat. <laughs> what about the grammar of it? It's fine. It's funny. It's fine. It's fine, it's fine. So you think it's fine? Anyone else got any thoughts on the grammar of poor deed vegan? Glasgow grammar? Glasgow grammar. Any other, what's grammar? Excellent, love it. <laughs> we're we're going to go there. Any other thoughts? Right, right. So I'll explain the grammar of this sign. But I don't know, it's certainly when I see this pure deed vegan, something in my head is like, that just doesn't feel quite right. And I don't mean in the, I'm just being prejudiced against Scots. I'm fine with Scots, but within Scots, this just grammatically doesn't quite sit right with me. So in some varieties of English, the word dead can be used as either an adjective, as in he is dead, or an adverb, so that's an intensifier, as in he is dead hungry, right? So you can say, he's dead hungry, she's dead angry. You use it as an intensifier. So it's kind of got these two grammatical functions, the same word. And if we say he's dead hungry, it's got nothing to do with death. We're, we're just using it in a different way as an intensifier. So it's got a different grammatical meaning. <coughs> the Scots word deed is equivalent to adjectival dead in English. But it can't also be used as an adverb. The adverbial form is the same as the English word dead. So we can have this word deed in Scots, but when you use the word deed in Scots, it has something to do with death, always. So it doesn't function as an intensifier in the same way. So that means you can have the stereotypical Glaswegian Scots phrase, pure dead brilliant, which people might well have come across. It's uh, when you fly into Presswick Airport. <laughs> Um, unless this has changed, it has this big sign saying pure dead brilliant. I always think when people arrive there and aren't familiar with Scottish language, they must be like, why is there a sign to do it, something to do with purity and death? <laughs> this is really strange. But pure dead brilliant in kind of Glaswegian Scots means really, really brilliant. So it's got this, these intensifiers. Um, so you can have pure dead brilliant, but you can't have pure deed brilliant. Or you can, but people who are kind of native speakers of Glaswegian Scots are a bit like, oh, that just doesn't quite feel right in my internal grammar. And generally, even if people know that grammatically, they find it quite hard to articulate because we don't talk about grammar that much. But when we do, 
we tend to be talking about the grammar of like standardised English, like the Queen's English, or standardised French or standardised German. So we think about grammar a lot when we're learning new languages or when we're perhaps scolding young people for using what we might think of as incorrect grammar. We don't often kind of think and talk about the grammar of a, a stigmatised variety like Glaswegian Scots. <coughs> but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have grammar. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't have grammatical rules. So when I say rules, just put these in inverted commas, I'm kind of talking about patterns here. So speakers of Scots, particularly younger and less wealthy people, are often told that the language they're using is grammatically incorrect or bad English. And certainly I was told this a lot as a kid. <clears throat> but the fact that we can have grammatically incorrect Scots, like pure deed vegan or pure deed brilliant, just doesn't quite work grammatically, <coughs> there's something wrong. That shows us that Scots has these underlying rules and grammatical structures that can be broken. Like if a, if a rule's there, then if a rule can be broken, it means it's there. Um, they exist and we just don't talk about them that much, unless we're linguists like me. <coughs> so this is also true of Yorkshire English, Cockney, Jamaican Creole, Indian English, every variety has its own internal rules, logic and structures that are often dismissed or ignored if that variety is in some way stigmatised or looked down upon socially. But they exist. All language has its rules and its structures. <coughs> so given that, um, so I, I make a podcast called That's Intricity, and the main reason that I started making it um, was that I wanted to kind of think about and tackle linguistic prejudice and, and talk to people about it quite openly. It's not like I don't have linguistic prejudices myself. Everybody has these kind of things going on in their brain where when you hear someone open their mouth and speak, you start to make assumptions about them. Um, and we all kind of have this kind of programmed into us from quite a young age, and I have this too. But as a linguist, I try and really interrogate that in myself and kind of pull those things out and look at them and have those conversations with other people too. So I have these conversations with my friends a lot. It's probably really annoying. But people will often kind of, I'll talk to them about language and linguistic prejudice, and then they'll say, oh, but the one thing that really annoys me, though, is when people say this. Um, and I think it's quite often, this is a rule I apply to myself, and I think it's quite a good rule. Before you complain about someone making what you think of as a language error, or before I do, I always ask myself, who says it's an error? Who gets to decide? Is the correct way of saying it actually just the way of saying it that we associate with richer and more powerful people? Because that's one way or another almost always the way. <clears throat> and deep down, is this complaint actually a complaint about a particular group of people rather than the linguistic feature itself? So often young people. Young people are always saying like all the time um, or something like that. It's, always, it's, it's quite often to do with a group of people rather than the language itself. And I think, I do worry that when I say this to people as part of my work or when I say it to friends, they think I'm just talking about being nice. That I'm just saying we, should, we, shouldn't, um, we shouldn't look down on the way that people speak or we shouldn't kind of be derogatory about the way people speak because it's not very nice. But it's really about being scientific as well. And this is something that linguists, linguists don't agree on very much. We, we like to argue amongst ourselves a lot. But we do agree that there's no such thing as a better or worse way of speaking linguistically. There's just linguistic difference. <coughs> so, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I thought I'd try out a little technical thing. So people who have phones and want to do this can scan this QR code or go to www.slido.com and use this code to join and answer the question, what is Scots? Um, now I'll try and get this up on the screen, but as I say, I'm not 100% convinced this is going to work, so we might just do it old school style by talking out loud. But I'll see if I can get it up here. Oh great, nothing's showing up. <coughs> maybe we'll just, maybe we'll just talk. Um, I was mostly only doing this because I thought it'd be really interesting to have some data to take away with me. But maybe I'll do it without. Okay, so, so just by shouting out then, if you can't get onto this, um, this, this slide open because I'm not convinced it's working. Um, anyone want to kind of venture an answer to the question, what is Scots? And this, if you've heard about Scots before, then tell me what you've heard. 
If not, just tell me what you think. It's a mix of different languages. Cool. What languages? Uh, I think it had the uh, people of the Vikings. Uh huh. Maybe Scotland brought a language. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the Celts. The Celts, yeah. yeah. Spanish. Spanish. It is, it's, it's a mixture of pretty much everything. Yeah. But in the same kind of way, we'll talk about this a bit more late, later, but in a lot of ways, all languages are a mixture of lots of languages, so it becomes quite complicated. Yeah? I thought it was a language. Mm, mm -hmm. I'm older than English. Mm, interesting. I should have read that somewhere. Mm -hmm. Have people come across this idea of Scots being language? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, have people come across the idea of people who speak English and Scots being multilingual speakers? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so this is beginning to be talked about a little bit more. So this is one of the reasons I wanted to um, kind of lure you guys into giving me some data. <laughs> is that, um, there's not been very much kind of up-to-date research on how people are thinking or talking about Scots um, outside of people who study it for a living. And I'm quite interested with what's, what's going on there. Um, so what is Scots? Sometimes referred to as a type of English and sometimes as a language in its own right, but officially recognised as a language in its own right since the year 2000. Um, and I think this is starting to become more visible in public life, but not, not quite as visible as <coughs> maybe some people who are Scottish language activists or academics think it is. Um, so if you go into the Scottish government website now, you can translate it into Scots. And it gives you something that doesn't look like any kind of Scots that I'm particularly familiar with, but it's a work in progress. We're, we're kind of working towards this. Um, and then, so it's officially recognised as a language in its own right. So theoretically, officially, people who speak English and Scots are multilingual. But that's something that, until people shouted it out now, I've actually heard a lot less. So I've not very often heard people who speak Scots and English being categorised as multilingual. And certainly I do a lot of work in schools, um, looking at multilingualism in schools and support for kids who have English as an additional language. And I've never seen a school categorising kids who speak English and Scots as multilingual or categorising kids who speak Scots at home and come to school and learn English as being English as an additional language kids. Um, and we'll come to in a second why some of the reasons that that might be. <coughs> oh no, we'll come to it right now, sorry. <laughs> so English and Scots are very, very closely related. So um, anybody here, well, people who, have, who are maybe not familiar with the idea of Scots, we'll, we'll play some examples in a wee minute. But English and Scots are very, very closely related and constantly co-mingle in everyday interaction. So that there's not really a clear border between them. This is very different from, for example, Scottish Gaelic, which people might have come across. So I'm learning Scottish Gaelic just now, and if there are any Gaelic speakers, please don't judge me, but if I was going to say that in that sentence in Gaelic, it would be Ha mi a gian sughug um, Gaelic andrasta. So, <laughs> so it sounds completely different from English. You couldn't you can sort of say, oh, I'm not really sure where the border is between those two languages. It's a really clear switch and a contrast. Um, but that's not the case with English and Scots. And you often hear people say that Scots, so people who kind of want to say that Scots isn't a real language will often say, well, what are you talking about? It's, it's so closely related to English. Um, but yeah, on the other side of the coin, you rarely hear that English isn't a real language because it's too closely related to Scots, which is an argument you could... Theoretically, linguistically, just as easily make. <clears throat> so listen to the following clips. Um, and I want you to think about and maybe shout out what are some of the underlying social rules that the kids are, are hinting at here. So we've talked a little bit about the grammatical rules um, that govern how we can and can't use Scots. Um, but there's also these social rules. And I hope you'll find these clips interesting. I certainly do. They're clips that I recorded during my PhD research, which I did a few years ago, um, in a school in Glasgow. Um, and I worked with a group of 21 kids. Um, some of them had moved to Scotland from other places 
and some had been born in Scotland. And these two clips are from two kids who'd been born in Scotland and had grown up in the same community. And I asked them about the type of language that they use in school and the type of language that they don't use in school. This kid, you're not meant to have favourites, but this kid's my favourite. <laughs> um, and let me know if you can hear and we can kind of mess with the volume a little bit. Okay, I just, oh, sorry. Okay, I just say what, but when I'm in school I say what, I don't know what, say what. Because <laughs> 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 I'm Managing to articulate a lot of really complicated stuff about language. Um, does anyone want to kind of suggest some of the social rules he's picking up on, or how you might put them in other words? Yeah, that's or it's, that's the way it's been treated in school anyway. Um, so that's so wet would be kind of the Scots form of the word, and what would be the standard English form. And he's got this awareness of when it's okay to say one. And when it's not okay. Anyone else? Yeah. He's, he's merging two different rules. It's uh -huh. rude to say what in yeah. English as well. Uh -huh. Aha! <laughs> That's not interesting. Because it's, not, because it's, just, it's just rude as, as a way of saying, uh, excuse me, please. Mm -hmm. um, and but he's, he's, the two are merging together in his experience. That's a really quite That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's something to do with intonation as well as the pronunciation, isn't there? Because perhaps saying, what might be okay, but if you say what, <laughs> then that would be and saying wet. So, but he's got this idea that maybe like Scots might be seen as more rude, but it's true. There's something interesting going on. He's talking about sentence structure as well, isn't he? That like it might be more acceptable in certain types of sentences than others. Like saying what's your name is okay, but not if you use the word on its own. So that's quite interesting. Um, I didn't include the last bit of the clip, which I should have done. But he goes on after this to say that. It depends on the teacher as well because he's got one teacher who grew up in the East End and you can say wet to him and that's okay. <laughs> but some of the other teachers don't like it. So there's kind of something there to do with who your interlocutor is, we would say, in linguistics or who you're speaking to. Um, anything else you'd want to pick up on from that clip? He's, he's engaging in course lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's mm. His teacher seems to see it as more, uh, more casual, but yeah. Not yeah, so he's engaging in code switching. So I actually used this at the beginning of my PhD thesis, this this clip, to kind of to make a few points. One of them being that kids from quite a long young age have this incredibly complex linguistic knowledge that we're not necessarily picking up on or utilising in education in the way that we could be. He's talking about grammar and about sentence structure and about these different linguistic rules and he's got all this knowledge and awareness but it's stuff that he hasn't really been asked to talk about before in an educational context. Um, he's doing real high level abstract thinking here that I think could make for really interesting classroom discussions but often doesn't because he's just being told to speak a different way than he does. He's engaging in code switching so um, one of the points that I wanted to make in my thesis using this clip as well, um, or extract, I didn't have clips, it was a written document, but I kind of printed this text. One of the points I wanted to make as well is that from his point of view, and kind of different into my own experience in school as well, it's definitely embarrassing to, when you're in school to be told off for not speaking the type of language that you're supposed to have in the classroom, but it's also really embarrassing to be speaking 
the type of language that's acceptable in the classroom all the time when other kids might make fun of you for that. So you kind of have to like develop this chameleon thing. Or depends what school you go to, but certainly <laughs> was the case in my school. Um, so I'll play you another clip now from another kid who I, I, I miss dearly, um, who's wonderful. And this is him talking about I and yes. So I should say I don't normally use the word slang, for because slang can be, it's kind of a derogatory term. But this was the word that he was using and the other kids were using to describe anything that wasn't like the standard, standard English. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of using it back to him here. Um, but this is what he has to say about slang. slang for yes in this very kind of teacherish kind of voice um, and there was loads of interest I, I had a great time doing some of my PhD research loads of interesting stuff going on to do with language and identity in this school and for these kids anyone want to say comment on anything that Callum told us there yeah sorry I don't I want to ask a question yeah what's code switching oh sorry yes that's a very good question so code switching is when you have more than one language or more than one variety or dialect and you move between them um, in the same interaction um, and people do it with lots of different languages but it happens all the time with English and Scots so and a, a really good example of code switching there a really clear one is when um, I ask him a question when do you when do you mean to use slang and he says he goes from beforehand he might have said when I want to act Scottish and then he goes when I want to act Scottish mm -hmm. so he's really kind of switching the way that he talks mm -hmm. and most of us do this at least to some extent um, with whatever kind of types of language we have in our repertoire um, but some people do it more than others some people kind of have more flexibility but if you look at almost anyone's speech up close enough you'll see them making slight shifts or alterations throughout the interaction, maybe to display a different part of their identity at a different moment, maybe to what we've called enacting, enacting a stance. So maybe if someone wants to kind of sound tough, they might use a different type of language. Um, and it's, it's a really fascinating thing that, like I say, most people do it. Maybe all people do it, we don't really know. But some people do it more than others. Good yeah. Does it need to be within, within an interaction to be code switching? Ah, oh, good question. Like, I would have called it code switching to, uh, to speak in a different way to start if you're like a job interview. Ah. Being, it, can you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. so oh, sorry. <laughs> so, so, if, so if somebody has, so for example, if somebody has a completely different voice that they use in a job interview situation and in another situation. I think that could be called code switching. Sometimes people use the word diglossia for that, um, where it's kind of a real split between different different types of language having different functions. Um, different contexts, yeah. Um, and most of the kind of code switching studies I've seen have looked at, I think linguists are, this is maybe a generalisation, but I think linguists are maybe particularly interested in it when it happens within a single interaction. But yeah, it's definitely, for some people, it's something that they do in quite a sort of systematic way throughout different um, situations in their lives. Yeah. Um, 
Does anyone want to say anything about Callum and what his thoughts are about language? Yeah. Of course you can, yeah. They are, at, so now they're probably, I think they might be in their 20s, which is terrifying. <laughs> but at the time that I recorded this, um, they're both, I'm using pseudonyms for both of them. So Cameron was 12. I think they were both 12 at this point. Yeah, so, so quite young. Yeah. They both come from the east end of Glasgow. Yeah, yeah. That and that might actually be they probably have stronger accents when they're with their friends. <coughs> um, I know that the even though I was younger at the time, the kids very much saw me as a grown up person coming to speak to them from the university and they very much thought of me as like a community outsider. So they probably did kind of shift their language more towards the way that they thought I spoke <laughs> myself. Um, which is quite interesting, yeah. Well, I was thinking, he sounds frustrated a bit about being constrained in not, in, <laughs> that he shouldn't use slang at home. Mm. And because he, see, he already identifies that as his natural way of speaking, mm. yet even his family, it's not regarded as... Yeah. Or, yeah. He's got this idea, well, when he's around the house, he should be allowed to. Mm. Like, maybe he accepts that in school, maybe that's and he maybe feels that's a normal thing to be told not to be at home and his mum's like no <laughs> yeah it was interesting that you used like i use like few, all the time yeah. <coughs> yeah is that not slangish yeah 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 no it totally is yeah <laughs> i would never claim not to use slang myself <laughs> um and it, it, so it's a discourse marker like um, that is associated with um, quite a lot with my age group and younger. But having said that, my PhD supervisor was a woman in her 50s and she uses like all the time as well. So I think it's just <laughs> becoming a thing. Yeah? I'm interested in the fact, though it doesn't surprise me, that neither Callum nor his mother are conscious of the different ways of deviating from standard English. Mm. Deviating into a private local language mm -hmm. on the one hand, and deviating into an archaic form on the other. Because I. I, I is never slang, it's just standard archaic English. Oh, that's interesting. Can I give you another example? Yes, please do. Let him who is without sin come to the <laughs> sounds archaic. Yeah. But on any building site, you always say cast when, when you're asking a machine driver to put the earth in one place or another. Mm. And everyone says that, including the engineers, including the people in charge. Mm. It's not slang, it's not even dialect. It's been preserved as the formal language of machine drivers. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very true. Yeah. yeah, quite a lot of um, Scots or what kids like these might call slang is just really old forms that have survived and a lot of the grammar as well things like saying um he has gotten um is the older form and that's that's pretty common but i guess they've now taken on different social meanings over time and maybe the the ancientness has been forgotten for some of these forms but yeah that's a really good point and I, I, the, you picked up on consciousness there, which I think is really interesting. The, the degree to which we're conscious of the way that our language shifts. And this is um, an ongoing, really interesting debate within linguistics itself. That I find really interesting is like, how much... Oh, I just said like again. <laughs> now I'm conscious. <laughs> but to what extent are we aware of these things that we're doing with language? It seems like some people are more aware than others. We're more aware at certain parts points in time than we are at other points in time. When one of our features gets pointed out to us, we become much more aware of it. Um, so that that question of to what degree, to what degree do we do we alter and shift our language consciously in order to present certain types of our identity, like a, um, certain parts of our identity, like I was saying before, or to like enact certain stances and to show. Um, our mood or to do something with an interaction and to what extent does it happen below the level of consciousness and that's kind of an ongoing question debate that a lot of people are interested in. So I'll move on. Um, so again there's an option to use this digital tool if you've got a phone and, and the internet and you can. Um, 
<coughs> but we can also maybe do, I guess we can do like a show of hands for this. So I'm going to play you five different clips of people speaking in Scotland, <laughs> people who are Scottish. And I'd really love just for my own interest sake, I'd really love to show a, see a show of hands for each person for whether you think they're speaking Scots or not. So I'll play you the first one. Sorry, I should say, hands up if you think he's speaking Scots. There is a big element, a, a truth in it, I suppose. I mean, it is a one class place. It's, it's a, it, you know, the, there is all these things leveled on it. But one thing it is that, that sort of tends to get mixed, m missed in it is that it's a really truthful place. So, hands up for Scots. Hands up for English. Hands up for something else. <laughs> oh, what's the thing you think is? Uh, Scottish Standard English. Scottish Standard English. Any other thoughts? <laughs> So English with a Scottish accent, that seems to be the most kind of popular, because everyone recognises it's got a Scottish accent, right? Yes. But um, I saw much more hands for English than for Scots. Okay, so I'm going to gonna put this in my mental when I think about it later. <laughs> yeah, yes, hang on. Oh, I don't need to pause that, sorry. Yeah. Okay, my question. Are we talking accents or dialects here? Oh, love it. Um, so when we, the term accent usually gets used to talk about phonetics or phonology. I'm going to try not to use too much technical gar jargon. But the term accent usually gets used to refer to the sound of speech within linguistics. But outside of linguistics, people often use the term accent to mean something very similar to dialect, to mean just a person's way of speaking. And in particular types of linguistics, people have started to think that maybe those terms aren't actually that useful and to use terms like linguistic repertoire or ways of speaking instead as more, potentially more neutral terms. But um, yes, yeah, there's a lot of debate about this. Um, so yeah, the kind of, I think the way that I was taught it when I started doing linguistics at university was the accents to do with the sound. When you bring in words and syntax and grammar, then you're talking about dialect um, or variety, sometimes is the term that gets used. So, speaker yeah. one to me, mm -hmm. he was speaking English with a Scottish accent. Mm. Yeah. So, and is that because you think his grammar was the same as English grammar, but his phonology? Yeah, I, think his, I think his grammar and his words were English. Okay, but his pronunciation his was... Scottish. Okay. And in terms of this context as well, this was, so I should have said this, these are all clips from my podcast that I make, Accentricity. So the context of this was him being told, being said, me saying, can I interview you for my podcast and sticking a big microphone in his face. And that also does affect the way people speak. So he might not speak like this at all when he's not got a big microphone in his face. Um, so there is that to think about too. And that's the case with all of these people that you'll hear. They've all, they've all got a big microphone in their face at this point. Um, which, mm, that's another thing within linguistics, I guess, is that almost all recordings of people we have, they have a big microphone in their face. So maybe we don't know that much about how language works when people don't have a microphone in their face. Um, your telephone voice, telephone voice yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, so speaker two, this is someone else I interviewed for my podcast. Um, so I'll play the clip and then we'll do like hands for Scots, hands for English. It's me, I remember hearing a Scots voice speaking on the telly and asking mum what was wrong with this person's voice because I'd never heard a Scottish person speaking on television. Okay, hands up for Scots. Yeah, hands up for English. Okay, hands up for something else. <laughs> this thing again, yeah. <laughs> cool. I'll play them. I think we're actually going to have similar answers for all of them, which is interesting for me, but I'll play them all. Okay, speaker three. I don't like common Glasgow accent. I am whispering that one. And you know what? Sometimes I forget. And I actually, if my mother was, if she'd turn in a grave sometimes because I'd come up with some slang, and my mum would have slapped me. Okay, hands up for Scots. Hands up for English. 
Hand up for something else. <laughs> yeah? Where do you, what do you think? Uh, did anyone hear? So I, I'm just going to give this away because I don't think anybody will guess. She's actually from South Africa, this woman. Um, she had been born in Glasgow and had lived in, no, she was born in South Africa and had lived there most of her life and had moved to Glasgow as a relatively old adult and just, despite saying she, she doesn't like Glaswegian accents, had completely adopted one. Um, I think you can hear a wee bit of it now and again in her voice. But yeah, okay, speaker four. Some people don't understand that. Some people don't try. That's a lot. A lot of times, people don't try and understand an accent. Like they just expect you to speak soft part. Like I'm putting air quotes on. <laughs> okay, and are we going to have similar votes for this, Scots? Hands up. English. Okay, so we're kind of moving towards thinking people speaking English. And then speaker five. Scientifically speaking. Oh, it's me. No accent's easier to understand than any other. Whether or not you understand an accent largely just depends on how familiar you are with it, as well as whether or not you expect to understand it. So this is me testing my theory that nobody identifies me as a Scots speaker, but people's <laughs> English? Is that what you like? Yeah. Cool. So which of these speakers... Hey, Mark, oh, the sorry, playing again. Oh my god, they're all playing at once, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think they stopped. <laughs> Which of these speakers did you think sounded the most Scots? The first one, yeah. Um, and then the least Scots would be me, probably. Yeah. Um, I think, I, to be honest, I gave you guys this exercise because I wanted to plant the seed in your head that it's quite difficult to necessarily say. You can hear, so that first speaker there, um, he was saying things like... Um, he has quite. I'll play. I'll play the first speaker one more time because he has some features that, as linguists, we would normally pick out and say that's definitely Scots. So I'll play him like again. Mark, that, that goes from the past. Um, you see, you come from Glasgow, and it's like there, there is a big element of a truth in it. I suppose. I mean, it is a one class place. It's it's a. It, you know, there, there is all these things leveled on it. But one thing it is that it sort of tends to get mixed, missed in it is that it's a really truthful place. So I kind of snuck it sneakily in the middle there, but he says there's these sort of things levelled at it. So that, in terms of grammar, is something that we'd identify as being like definitely not English, like definitely Scots. And some people who haven't spent a lot of time in Scotland wouldn't really know what that meant. Um, so that really we would pick up as being Scots. But just because he's got one definitely Scots feature that he uses in that stretch of speech, does that mean he's speaking Scots? It becomes this kind of grey area, and I think this is where you can see that the border between what's Scots and what's English is really, really fuzzy. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, it's doing it again. Ah! Okay. As in the breed is in the bread basket. You know, like, we'll slang some things when it suits us, then other things we'll, you know, we'll say the use the proper word rather than the, you know, the Scots. Sorry, I'm used to using a Mac, so I'm just causing absolute chaos in these tiny clips on a Windows PC. Um, did someone have a question there? I was just going to say that you can hear that he's from the Glasgow area, mm. and also the intonation and some words, when he's saying certain words, he's, he lengthens it out just like. Mm. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should say as well, we're, we've kind of been talking about accent pronunciation being different from grammar, from syntax and words. But when we talk about languages, they're a collection of the pronunciation and the syntax and the words. So like linguistically, there's not this big distinction between, well, that's to do with accent, so that's not Scots. Like accent features could definitely be to do with Scots and a pronunciation like, in this example, he says, they call us half and halves. That's a pronunciation <laughs> difference, but half is very much a Scots, the Scots form and half is the... The, the standard English form, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's this kind of quite, it's this fuzzy thing, and unfortunately linguists don't have an answer, like we don't, unfortunately, or fortunately, we don't have an answer, we'll come on to this more. So this, this kind of clip here, um, we can pick out the words that are definitely Scots, um, or that someone who kind of is an, is an expert in Scots and studies it would pick out as saying they're definitely Scots. Mm -hmm. So people, mm -hmm. Faycote Bridge, quite different to 
from Coatbridge, mm-hmm. half mm-hmm. and half, so he kind of shows that distinction himself, um, and the bead is in the bread basket. So those are, in a way, all to do with the, the pronunciation, are they? I think they are. Um, maybe fae is a completely different word from from, but linguists don't know. So I guess the question is then, how can it be a real language if you can't say for sure when somebody's speaking Scots and when they're speaking English? And I think this is, in some ways, the big the big question that's hanging over Scots at the moment, and that people, certainly with my linguistic people, have quite heated debates about. Um, you sometimes hear debates about this on the radio and stuff. How can how can that be a thing? So I wanted to introduce you guys to a threshold concept. Um, So I work in, I study language, but I work in the School of Education at Glasgow Uni. Um, (coughs) So I do a bit of work on on educational theory as well. And I've been reading recently about threshold concepts. So a threshold concept is an idea that once you learn it and understand it and accept it, it changes the way you see the world. And this could be in a small way, or it could be in a big way. But it kind of fundamentally alters something about the way that you see things. And it can't be unlearned. So Jan Mayer and Ray Lands uh, write about it like this. They say, a threshold concept can be considered as akin to a portal, opening up a new and previously inaccessible way of thinking about something. (coughs) So I'm going to introduce you to something that for me was a threshold concept. Might not be for you guys, or maybe it'll be later when you think about going away and reading more. Um, But this is something that changed the way that I think about language. And I realise there might be people in the room who this know all about this theory anyway and are just like, well, yeah, obviously, but to some people it might be new. (coughs) So translanguaging theory. So translanguaging theories, this whole area of linguistics that I've been kind of increasingly diving into, and I found it really, really useful for the way that I think about Scots in particular, even more than other languages. So translanguaging theory kind of comes with a few a few different kind of ideas and ways of seeing things. So first of all, translanguaging. So in the name of this theory, language becomes a verb, so not a noun. Um, so translanguaging, and people who kind of work with this theory will talk about people languaging, not people speaking, but people languaging. Um, so suggesting that language is something we do, not something that just is. So it doesn't live in dictionaries. It doesn't live on the page, it doesn't even live in recordings, it doesn't live in old songs, it lives in amongst us, and it's what we do. It's quite abstract, I hope, I hope that's okay with people. We'll get back on to um, listening to sound clips and stuff later. Um, <coughs> and it, translanguage in theory suggests that individual, separate, countable languages are just social constructs, not natural, objective categories. And this definitely took me a wee while to get my head around. So if people are like, what? Then that's kind of what it's supposed to do to you. It's supposed to make you go, what? But um, yeah, individual separate languages are just social contracts. So so the idea that when you talk about a language, you're actually talking about the way people think about a certain type of, of, a certain way of speaking. You're talking about a social idea that we've all agreed on and kind of share. The borders between languages aren't solid, stable facts. So it might make more sense to think about language as a thing and people who kind of people who speak quite a lot of languages or know quite a lot of languages might have this idea of the way that languages sometimes merge into each other. So the Scandinavian languages, I don't speak any of them, but from what I know, um, people who speak Danish might be able to understand, people who speak Swedish and people who speak Norwegian can kind of understand some Swedish from some parts of Sweden. So there's this kind of idea of languages merging into each other a bit. And translanguaging theory encourages a more open perspective on language ownership. So for example, if somebody uses the word pizza, then for that little moment in time, you're speaking Italian. Why not? It's your language too. (coughs) And translanguaging theory has allowed linguists who work with it to take a new approach to looking at how people mix languages or code switch. Translanguaging theorists don't really use the term code switch so much anymore because the idea is that rather than moving between distinct things, 
we are doing something much more fluid and much more dynamic and much more difficult to pin down. So the argument here is that when multilingual people are communicating in, for example, a mixture of Spanish and English, um, and a lot of the work has been done with Spanish and English in the United States, they're mostly not thinking, now I'm speaking Spanish and now I'm speaking English. They're just speaking. They're just using their linguistic repertoire, which includes linguistic resources from both languages. So an outsider might listen to a recording and think that what they're hearing is now Spanish and now English, but that's not what's happening from the speaker's points of view. So this is a little bit complicated and abstract. But for me, when I first came across this theory, I found it really hard to get my head around, and then I started applying it to Scots, which is the linguistic situation that I know best, that I've kind of grown up with from an early age. And to me, it kind of, it just, I, I guess sometimes abstract things are quite hard to get your head around until you pin them to something concrete that you understand well. And for me, I really first started to understand translanguage and theory and feel that it made sense um, when it got into Scots. And I know, by the way, because I've definitely spoken to people who, when I talk to them about translanguage and theory, are just like, and that's fine. It's not for everyone, but for me, I find it quite useful. Um, so I'll play this clip again, because we kind of skipped over it a wee bit earlier. As they call us halves, and halves, like, as in uh, the breeders in the bread basket, you know, like, we'll, we're slang sometimes when it suits us, and then other times we'll, you know, we'll say the music proper one, rather than the, you know, the Scottish. So the kind of traditional approach would be to say the words in blue here are Scots, the words in black are shared vocabulary between English and Scots. But from a translanguaging approach, he's just speaking. He's just talking. His linguistic repertoire contains both Scots and English. Now let's move on to talking about something else. Um, and I think what I like about translanguaging theory and applying it to Scots is that it kind of allows us to move on and talk Where's about she? more interesting things than where does Scots end and English begin? What is a dialect and what is a language? Because I've been working in this field for a while now and those kind of questions get a bit boring after a while. <laughs> so taking a translanguage and approach to Scots, it removes this problem of whether someone is speaking Scots or English at a given time. In translanguage and theory, we're just speaking. We're expressing our identities using all of the words and grammar and pronunciations that are available to us. Taking a translanguage and approach to Scots suggests that we should probably stop worrying about what counts as Scots and what doesn't about where the border is between English and Scots, and it allows us to just appreciate the complexity and creativity of language and identity in Scotland. And that's, that's the way that translanguaging theory gets used a lot, is to say, let's just be interested and curious and celebrate what people are doing. <coughs> Taking a translanguaging approach to Scots makes it clear that Scots is as much of a real language as we want it to be, because all real languages are invented anyway. So if we want to say that Scots is a language, that's fine. If we don't, whatever. Um, within translanguage in theory, whether we call something language, dialect, code, variety, accent, so coming back to this idea of terminology, um, the terminology isn't so much about the language itself. It's quite often about politics and power. Not so much with the discussion we were having earlier. Like You can say, OK, accent, more to do with sound, dialect, more to do with words and grammar. But... You often get this thing where languages... So, for example, I had a student who was from Ghana and I was asking them about the diff what different languages they had in this book and they were like, oh, just English. And I was like, oh, but not... are you sure? Because I'm sure I heard you speak. Did you not say you spoke another language? I like, no, I speak English and then I speak a bunch of like African dialects. So there's sometimes this idea that languages, if they're not going to be like valued in mainstream education, are called dialects. Um, this very strange thing. So, yeah, this kind of happens where the terminology becomes more about politics and power rather than anything linguistic. <clears throat> and people might have come across this, this phrase before, but this idea, a language is a dialect with an army and a, and a navy. Um, as far as I can tell, no one actually knows where this quote comes from, like what the source is. It was popularised by Max Weinrich, I think his name is. 
Um, but I think it is quite a useful way of thinking about language and politics and power and the way that we value the types of language that have an army and a navy behind them and not always others. And then taking a trans language and approach to Scots can potentially make space for a more open attitude to language ownership, acknowledging linguistic identities that include the use of Scots alongside English, but also Urdu, Polish, Mandarin. So people who work in trans language in theory often work across lots of different languages. And I think this increasingly matches up with the reality of modern Scotland. So as I was saying, my PhD research I worked with a bunch of kids in a school in the east end of Glasgow. Um, a lot of them had moved from Poland to Scotland. Um, but when I spoke to them and I said, I kind of came in with some questions like, well, are you Scottish or are you Polish? And some of the kids said, oh, I'm, I'm Polish. And some of the kids said, oh, I'm Scottish. And some of the kids said, well, I don't know, like neither, I'm, I'm a goth. Like, that's what's important to me. Um, some of them said, obviously both. Like, what, what are you talking about? Clearly both. Um, I remember one kid, I spoke to her, and during our conversation, she started off, she was talking about, in Poland we do this. And then later on, she was like, oh, in Poland they do that. So she kind of switched there from being part of that group to not part of that group in a single interaction with me. So it's complicated. Um, there were kids who I spoke to who weren't Polish, who had learned a little bit of po like not who were fluent in Polish, but who had picked up bits of Polish from their pals. There was this group of girls who were, some of them were Polish and some weren't, but when they said hello or goodbye to each other, they went, Kochanshi, which means like, I love you. Um, so there's complicated stuff going on in terms of language and identity and really interesting stuff. I think particularly for younger generations in Scotland just now. And trans language in theory, I think, as a kind of area and a way of a lens for looking at language kind of makes space for a little bit of this complexity. <coughs> and taking a trans language in approach to Scots might allow us to refocus on how conversations about Scots relate to inclusion and such social justice, which for me is 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 where it really <coughs> matters. Like I think I do think that language is interesting in its own right, but I'm more interested in, langu in language in terms of how it relates to people and their experiences than as an abstract thing by itself. And I think trans language in theory is quite useful for that. Um, so this, I'm kind of, this is the first time I'm kind of presenting on this, this kind of line of inquiry that I've been thinking about recently. Um, and it's something I'm just starting a new project on. So I'm going to be working on in uh, two schools in Glasgow starting from hopefully next month and thinking about translanguaging in relation to multilingual identities in the school and taking in kids who have all different linguistic backgrounds, some who are born in Scotland, some who aren't. Um, one of the schools is a bit posher than the other as well so that's going to be interesting in terms of in terms of language and identity and what's going on. Um, and I'm also working on podcast series where I'm going to be thinking about multilingualism across Scotland, including Shetland and Aberdeenshire, and um, I've been on a trip to Lewis and Skye, where we're Gaelic spoken a lot, and then also the Central Belt and Roundabout. So um, <coughs> yeah, I think, um, I think trans language and theory is going to be something that I'm working with and thinking about more. Um, but I wanted to kind of end on this little story that I think is really interesting in terms of the complexity of linguistic identity <coughs> in contemporary Scotland. So this is from, from the Glasgow Times, so it's possible some people came across this article at the time, but maybe not, um, for people that live in Perth. Um, so I showed you this sign earlier, the pure deed vegan sign. So um, this is where I came across it. Glasvegan Cafe's pure deed vegan sign criticism laughed off by owner. So, the Glass Vegan Cafe in St Enoch Square was criticised in a tweet for having a sign which read Pure Deed Vegan in its window. A Twitter user, who we are choosing not to name, said that the sign showed that whoever had written it hadly spoken a day's Glasgow dialect in their life and told the cafe owner to F off back to Bothwell. <laughs> so, for people who 
aren't familiar with what Bothwell might stand for, it's kind of being used here as a stand-in for a middle-class place. So I think we're assuming this Twitter user is someone working class from Glasgow who kind of uses Glaswegian Scots as part of their daily life and is assuming that the person who, who made this, who named the place Pure Deed Vegan, is someone who's kind of using Scots um, but doesn't actually speak it. So then the next part of the article, Arata, the Latvian owner of the Sydney Jennifer Cafe, <laughs> said she researched the sign before putting it up and remains confident she's got it right. She speaks three languages fluently and while she concedes that she hasn't ever spoken in a, in a Glaswegian dialect, she said not for a second that, did I think that it would cause any trouble. This gets better by the way, I love this article. <coughs> The Twitter user promised to pop in and buy lunch from the cafe to make up for the fussy cause. He said, the shop's Glaswegian theme definitely made me assume the owner was from somewhere in Greater Glasgow, hence the Bothwell comment, so he assumed it was a middle class Glaswegian. Anyone brought up with a strong Glasgow accent will recognise the embarrassing feeling of being outright told, or at least socially pressured, by middle class Scottish people to speak properly, as if it makes you stupid or incorrect to have a certain accent. Because I caricatured the cafe owner as being a middle class person, there's a sense of injustice created by the fact that you're not allowed to speak their Scottish accent incorrectly, but they don't bother to check with anyone whether they're speaking ours correctly. There are undoubtedly genuine examples of this phenomenon out there, it just turns out that this is not one of them. <laughs> and people might well have spotted so I think this comes up a lot on, on social media actually a lot. Like I've got quite a few friends who have a much more kind of Scottish standard English middle class way of Scottish way of speaking, but will kind of write in, in Scots um, on social media when they're making a joke. Um, or you'll sometimes kind of see people writing signs in Scots um, as this kind of like slight like cultural cachet thing or it's it's funny, it's for a joke. So I, I can see what he's tapping into here. <coughs> the information that she's from Latvia does change things obviously. <laughs> I had a Polish colleague whose repeated misuses of the dialect was actually very endearing rather than annoying. A bit patronising, but whatever. Um, I did feel bad when people started pointing out that my caricature of the owner was a totally incorrect guess, but hopefully she takes it in good humour. I'll pop in and buy lunch to say sorry. So essentially this guy has been like, he's seen the sign pure deep vegan and been like, whoa, what is this posh person like taking my language and speaking it wrong? And they go, oh sorry, oh, you're not posh, you're just, you're, you're from somewhere else. That's fine then. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I got the bench. So I think there's really interesting and complex things going on to do with this idea of who owns what language, who language belongs to. And I think this is becoming increasingly complicated in probably a lot of places, but certainly in the place I know, which is Scotland, where with migration and maybe with changes as well in the way that people in the ways that class and language are intertwined like the idea so i've read quite a lot of stuff written about glaswegian scots in the 70s and earlier where people are just saying oh no it's disgusting it's terrible this <laughs> it shouldn't be um and the idea that there could be some kind of cultural cachet in you taking it and using it to name your shop I think would have been quite unimaginable for a lot of people and I really think that yeah there's interesting changes going on that I don't fully understand yet but I'm quite interested in um, and then there's also this element of um, migration I know that now there are Scots language so particularly in the northeast of Scotland um, there are now Scots language classes that you can go to if you're moving into the area as a refugee or as someone migrating from another country and you can kind of learn English and learn Scots at the same time and I think that's really interesting. Um, so I'll take some questions in a, in a wee second but um, I've got some more QR codes if people like both, that sort of thing. Um, so my podcast that's interesting, I've got some flyers at the door as well if anyone wants to take one away. Um, and I'm just sharing it because I'm really proud of it and I like it. Don't make any money from it or anything, but um, I'm very proud of it. So there's the first two series is it up online, and they're mostly about well, they're all about language and identity from different angles. Um, as I say, I'm starting work on a new series of the podcast, and that's going to be a kind of eight-ish episode, although it keeps getting longer. 
um, a deep dive into language and identity across Scotland. Um, the previous series has didn't like focus explicitly on Scotland, but this one's going to be like, who are we linguistically? What's going on? Um, and yeah, that's my, my Twitter handle, although I don't really use Twitter that much anymore, to be honest. So maybe email me if you want to talk or suggest anything, um, things that I might want to focus on in the new series of the podcast, or if you want to keep any conversations going after tonight. Um, but yeah, that's me, and I think we've got a little bit of time left for... Uh, yeah, we've got, yeah. We got a bit of time for questions. Actually, I was just sitting there thinking to myself, how are we going to speak when I stand up? Mm. Am I going to, awesome, going to use, my, am I going to use my university educated mm. transatlantic mm. middle class accent? Or am I going to just slip back into speaking like a Carnoustie bairn? Mm. Like I did when I was away in Carnoustie. Mm. Anyway, we'll stick with the educated accent for a while. Uh, I'm so sorry to everyone who's suddenly become really aware of their own accent. I know it's terrible. Linguistics is terrible. Right, I thought that was fabulous. Questions? Yeah. David, yes. Uh, do the translanguage people admit how much of their thinking they've borrowed from Ludwig Wittgenstein? He <laughs> <laughs> is famous that there's no such thing as a private language. Ah. And that the meaning of language is in its use. So did you hear that or shall I no. translate? <laughs> do they, uh, the tra what do you call it? The translanguaging guys. Yeah, translanguaging like guys realise how much they borrowed from Ludwig Wittgenstein. Okay, and I've forgotten the second half of the question because that was a lot of words. Yes. <laughs> He's saying that one, there is no such thing as a private language, and there cannot be. Says mm. there's no such thing as a private language, and That's there cannot quote. be. I like that. Okay. And, and, and second, the meaning of language is in its use. Ah. The meaning of language is in its use. Oh, you're right, aren't you? Yeah. I would say, <laughs> undoubtedly... Is he's, too, he's too learned and erudite. Undoubtedly they do, but if you saw my face when you said that, I did a bit of a... because I haven't read his work. <laughs> but I will, now that you've said it, so thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. Yes, more I was going to your interview, particularly with Grimms. As they became more comfortable with you, mm. and didn't see you as an academic threat, and weren't telling more. Mm. Did they start speaking in a different register? Oh, good question. So Malcolm says, uh, the kids that Sadie was interviewing, obviously we looked at her like some posh university person in the beginning, but as they got to know her, did they slip back into their normal speech pattern? Yeah, this is a great question, because I can tell you about my sort of main headline PhD findings. Um, so yes, well, I didn't actually specifically look at changes over time in terms of how they interacted with me. But what happened was I went into the school, I got to know them pretty well, but like I say, still a bit of a community outsider for sure. Um, and certainly like not their pal, maybe, maybe a little bit pallier with them than their teachers, but still an outsider. And then I started um, recording interviews with them at that point when they knew me fairly well. But then what happened was, I made recordings of them in an after school club that I set up where they were <coughs> running about with their pals, chatting to their pals, shouting, screaming, having fights, all the things that kids do. Um, and then I made recordings of them sitting face to face talking to me. And then got one of my supervisors to come in who it sounds posher than me, but also isn't Scottish. She's from Mexico, so she's kind of got quite a posh accent in English um, but doesn't have a Scottish accent um, and she came in as a complete unknown person to them the first time they met her was when the microphone was on and she set up quite a sort of formal school-like situation where she got them to look at a picture book and then she interviewed them about what they'd seen in the picture book so it kind of felt a little bit maybe like a test to them and when she introduced herself she's like I'm Evelyn, I'm from the university, and deliberately made it feel quite formal. And across, I think, five different linguistic features, the kids dramatically changed across those three contexts. So um, one of the ones that I've kind of published about since is the glottal stop. Um, so when they were speaking with their friends, they would say things like, oh, I want a bottle of water. And then when they were with me, I used the glottal stop quite a lot. And they did too. So the 
I should pause and say the glottal strop <laughs> is uh, in a word like bottle. Um, if you say it with a released T, it's bottle. And if you say it with the glottal strop, it's bottle. Um, and it's a little bit stigmatised, but not one of the most stigmatised linguistic features. Anyway, so with me, they would do it a little bit. With Evelyn, on the graph, it was like, like they completely started to say bottle of water instead. But the really interesting finding that I really like, so I mentioned that some of the kids I worked with had been born in Glasgow and lived in Glasgow all their lives. Some had moved from Poland to Scotland. To make it a bit more complicated, there were some kids from other countries, but kind of to focus on those, I focused on those two groups in the analysis. <coughs> so the Glaswegian kids kind of had this pattern to some extent where they used, they, they sounded much more Glaswegian with their pals, um, less Glaswegian with me, and less again with my supervisor, Evelyn. Totally makes sense. But the Polish kids did that more than the Glaswegian kids, so they shifted more um, as a group. So not, not every single one of them, but as a group, there was more of a shift. And that was including some kids who had been in the UK for like a year or two. So that was pretty incredible. And that was people, that wasn't a finding that was kind of replicated from elsewhere. That was quite new in the, in the literature. So that was quite exciting for me in terms of research. Um, and really fascinating, and I've spent a lot of time since then trying to work out why that might be. And if anyone's got any ideas, I would love to hear them. Um, so, mm, so what about the identity? Yeah, just, uh, oh, sorry. Let this gentleman think about this. So, by saying that, I thought it's about what to identify that and now you become Scottish mm. or not Polish. Mm. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, we've got family members who were pretty young and moved to Spain and they went to Spanish schools uh, and they had to learn Spanish. Uh, and one of them uh, was lucky enough, uh, her mum was Spanish and when she was a wee child, the mum spoke Spanish to her. And then after a few years, the brother came along, she stopped speaking Spanish, started to speak English. So when we went to Spain, uh, the, the daughter, uh, she picked up pretty quickly. But the, also the, the son didn't pick up at all. He thought he only had Spanish. Uh, and we met with him uh, on holiday. And now, you know, uh, the son is now about 21, is he? 21. Okay. And I asked him, do you identify as Spanish? Or do you identify as being Scottish? And he says, I think identified now as Spanish. I said, why do you say that? He said, well, I knew I was Spanish when I started to dream in Spanish. Ah, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. Know, yeah. Tried asking that question to a lot of the Polish kids, but a lot of them were like, I don't know what language I dream in. <laughs> Which I thought was quite interesting. No, do I? No, I'm not sure. Welcome. Quick, quick follow-up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, it's going back to what they were asked about the cookies time. Uh -huh. and, uh, I haven't read it. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's this idea of language as its own side. Yes, yeah. And, uh, and uh, it has to be a two-way thing. Mm. So does cadence allow a certain language in and stop other languages getting in? Oh. In other words, the, can you, does the cadence in which you speak change the way in which you can? Okay, did you hear that? No, it's, no, it's, no. it's about the okay. Well, that's because the cadence in which you speak, okay, mm -hmm. have some impact on well what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> on how languages are allowed in. Oh and how that's languages are allowed in, yeah. Particularly like the, the East West divide that is so deeply uh, exemplify yourself in different <laughs> They have yeah. So the role of cadence in language. Yeah, and are we talking here about different kind of very different languages or very closely related ones? <laughs> no. I think he's talking about the difference in cadence between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what I mean is, when, when you went to Glasgow, mm. did you find that your your cadence? 
and use of language have to change to be understood completely? No. Or did you meet a, a different more? Did it change so and did you find yourself thinking differently when you started speaking more Glaswegian? I didn't actually know that I started speaking more Glaswegian. <laughs> Tom informed me of this. No, friends <laughs> friends have told me before that my accent's changed quite a lot since moving. But um not it was never conscious. Mm. On any level, so yeah. Yes, the lady. Uh, yeah. mm. Do you think there's a, an element of mirroring mm. and to be accepted? Yeah. Because yeah. I know personally, my, my accent, I'm West Coast, but I'm very West Coast when I'm back home, mm. but less so because it's a kind of mirroring. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So do people, do people engage with an accent, engage in mirroring the accent that surrounds them in order to become accepted? Yeah, I mean, I do think that's one of the things that was going on with my PhD findings for sure, and that's been quite well studied and researched. Um, there, a colleague of mine who was doing a PhD at the same time as me, but in an area that I really didn't understand, was using computational linguistics to look at, he was looking at, yeah, I really don't understand, but he was looking at what goes on in people's brains. Um, and I know there's been research where people go into an MRI machine and are told to speak and they look at what's going on in your brain when you, when you mirror someone when they're speaking. Um, there's also been really interesting research on the opposite. So when, because you're more likely to mirror someone who you quite like or you want to like you, but also if you dislike someone, sometimes you do the opposite where you try and speak less like them. Or maybe not consciously, but on a subconscious level which I think is quite interesting too. I think I've caught myself doing that before, kind of slightly creating distance with language as well as closeness. So we'll come to you in a moment. Mm -hmm. We'll take a question from the lady at the back of the room. But linked to the, the question that was asked earlier about cadence and mm -hmm. bearing in mind all the comments that you've made about subtleties and mm -hmm. regional differences and all that's going on there, is that, do you think why um, actors find it so difficult to do a Scottish accent or ah. to use Scots. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is a question it's, about some of them are painful. <laughs> yes, I actually have um uh, one of you hear that. Oh sorry. Yeah. Okay, this is a question about uh, cadences and subtleties between different uh, accents. Uh, is this why some actors find it difficult to actually put on a convincing, say, Scottish accent? Um, I, I've actually, there's a, I did a podcast episode on this, so this is a great question. So I've got, um, I think it's called, I think it's called Fake Accents, the episode, and it's about um, actors putting on accents and doing it badly a lot of the time. And I talked to linguists from different countries about the worst examples of an accent from their country. Um, who did we kind of give the prize to for the worst Scottish accent? I can't remember now. But, um, hmm? <laughs> there's there's been so many examples. So I don't I actually I don't really know why it's so difficult for actors to put on Scottish accents. But I think the kind of semi conclusion I came to make in the episode and talking to linguists about it was that it's maybe to do with just exposure. Because um, we couldn't really find a reason why it would be difficult linguistically to do a Scottish accent. Although a lot of people have a lot of actors, especially in voice coaches, have their own ideas. But I think Scottish accents outside of Scotland are maybe less heard than some other accents, um, which makes it more difficult. Like, I think Scottish people find it quite easy to do American accents a lot of the time because a lot of our telly is in American. Um, and it doesn't really work the other way because the Americans maybe don't hear Scottish accents as much. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure. And this question of cadence is really interesting, by the way, but I don't know. So I'm kind of currently putting this in a little box in my head to go away and think about, and maybe I'll have an answer in eight years' time. <laughs> yes, so what do you do? It seems to me that you're talking very much about accents, and these children that you interviewed have a smattering of Scots. How do they actually learn their Scots? When I was young, I learned it from a granny, from that generation, and it was spoken. It wasn't written, mm -hmm. you know, words like Bahuki, and Kaki Bogle, mm -hmm. and Ned, and Youngs. Yes. Mm -hmm. These words are Scots. Uh -huh. Right. That's is the Scots language dying out? Is it going oh. to be taught in schools? Is there a move to do that? 
Yes, there, there absolutely is. Um, sorry, sorry. Did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this comes back to the accent. Well, I asked about accent and dialect. That a lot of the kids that Sadie was talking to were talking in what I would call just English words with a few Scots words thrown in. But like my grandfather, like your grandfather, it would have been practically unintelligible to those kids today. He used a completely different vocabulary. Mm. Yeah. So what's happening to try and uh, maintain, protect and grow the use of that real Scots vocabulary? <laughs> so yeah. my... And the grammar too, yes. And the grammar, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And people do often forget this when they're talking about Scots, that there, there's quite distinct Scots grammar as well. Um, so my supervisor, um, Jen Smith, has done a lot of work on dialect life or death or what's what's happening and trying to predict what's happening in the northeast of Scotland with Doric and Shetland and unfortunately yeah a lot of her research is seeing quite a rapid decline at the moment in terms of she she, ta she likes to talk about it like change maybe it's change rather than decline but there is she did publish a paper called dialect death in Shetland so um, <laughs> there is a sense that maybe um, and it's unfortunately it's the same with a lot of minority languages all over the world. It's it's happening with Gaelic. Um, it's happening with a lot of languages where there's not maybe enough being done to protect the languages, and there's not as much intergenerational transmission happening like you're talking about. <coughs> um, so kids like Callum and Cameron, who I've played you clips from, they would be picking up their Scots from their parents and grandparents. Um, the Polish kids, who were using a lot of Scots, would have been picking it up from their pals. So that would be kind of a different learning situation. And then in terms of teaching Scots in schools, there is a, a big movement and there's loads of really interesting work being done. Um, I would say at the moment, quite a lot of the Scots that happened... So, so in my own school, we did, we did do Scots in school. Um, so we were given Robert Burns' poems and a few more contemporary poems and we were kind of taught about that and told to, told to write poems in Scots. I kind of left those classes with this idea that Scots was just for poetry um, and I definitely left them with an idea that there was a thing called Scots, like in Robert Burns' poetry, but that when we were using words like meeps or tatty bogle or whatever, that wasn't proper Scots because it wasn't Burns. So we kind of had this idea of like poetic literary Scots but but not an idea of it being alive in our lives and being what we just spoke with our mums and our grannies and stuff. And I think, not to criticise everything that's happening because there's loads of great stuff happening with Scots in schools um, and there's a few schools in particular that I know of that are doing amazing work. Um, Kids can now do, not in all, all schools, but in some schools, kids can now do a Scots language certificate um, towards the end of school where they basically are able to explore their own Scots use and things. And there's great stuff happening, but is it enough? Time will tell. I'm not sure. And yeah, we are seeing this thing around the world. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. And people, of course, are still doing that. Okay, um, we're going to have to wind up fairly soon because I don't know if any of our regulars remember the evening we had the lady from Anstruther and I ended up having to drive her home. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so Sadie has to get to Glasgow. However, a question from Sabrina and Sadie. I want you to listen very, very carefully to Sabrina's accent and then we're going to ask you questions on it. Oh no, okay. So speak loud and clear. Okay, um... Just listening to everything um, with the, um, the the sort of the cadence change and the slang change and everything else, for me it boils down to language acquisition, because um, your first language you you build your world in your first language, and everything else the, is a very much awareness of whatever you, your language is goes into a different language as well. So um, having the Polish kids, they're probably, when they were born, they were never, they were not coming to Scotland. They didn't have the bilingual acquisition of, of English, Scots, Polish, or whatever. So for them, it's easier to switch from one to the other because they're um, basically doing it much more aware. Uh, 
if you are um, a Scottish speaker um, learning English at the same time, you are bilingual, as in they're both the same level. So your awareness of going from switching from one to the other is much more um, a, a sort of a level of, um, of, of register. Yeah. Um, there's not so, uh, so you've got the, the home, that's Scots, you've got school, that's English, and what have you not. So that sort of switch over is much less aware of them for them. Mm. And so I you're would talking about explaining that, that yeah, ending in my PhD exactly, that the Catholic exactly, but more on the other me. hand, it comes to that trans language. Trans languaging. Yeah, mm. and I love that. I mm. really love that. I mean, I I, I'm bilingual as well. Mm. So um, for me, that's my language. Mm. And I need to really very much aware if I go into my <coughs> language or if I go into English don't, or don't slash. Don't tell what your language is. No, oh. I'm not. I'm, I'm definitely not. <laughs> so um, I might have more Scots in my English because my English comes from Scotland. Uh -huh. But there's also a very, very, I mean, in my, my, my mind, I have a sort of my language, mm. but I have to either translate it into <coughs> my first language or into English. Uh -huh. And I have to do that really aware. So mm. that is really yeah. fascinating. That was a paradigm shift for me as well. So mm. thank you very much. So uh, what's uh, Sabrina's first language? German? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well done. Okay. My, uh, my boss was on the radio um, in Manchester. We were doing a project called Manchester Voices. And he got asked on the air if he could say where in Greater Manchester these three people were from. Um, who were callers in and he got it spot on right and then I spoke to him about it afterwards and he was like no I was listening to them talking beforehand and they said I never would have been able to tell if I had known <laughs> you know, I, I grew up in Carnoustie and I remember growing up in Carnoustie and I could listen to someone from Angus and I could tell if they were from Arbroath, mm. Forford, Kirimuir, Moneyfeath okay or even from Freegham for goodness sake. Yeah? I don't think you can do that anymore. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I think there's I think the, the I think those accents have merged mm -hmm. to an extent where the real distinction has disappeared. Either that or I just haven't lived there for a long time. <laughs> Same thing in Gaelic apparently. I was talking to someone about it recently. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we've got time for people actually move. Yeah. Uh? Text from a wall sitting over there. He says, "Throw in some Dutch." Yeah, because it's been too Italic. It's been Netherlands and and Engels. Uh, there you go. Yeah. There's a, a lot of Scots words which are also the same in the Scandinavian mm. languages. And lots of Scots words come from Dutch and Flemish. Mm. Yeah, they yeah, did. Mm. Absolutely. So I think we got time for one more question before I possibly have to drive her to Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Gordon. Uh, do you think that some of the people that you are interviewing from Glasgow schools were equating slang with Scots? Yes. Yes, yes I, think that's true. I do. And I think that's interesting in itself. I mean, what slang is, we don't really have a linguistic definition. It's just basically people use the word slang for a language that they don't like a lot of the time or language they think is like not particularly good and unfortunately that's often the fate of Scots in schools is that people are like that doesn't really belong here so we'll call it slang um, but there's no real linguistic it's not a linguistic term that we really like to use very much um, but apparently I use it when I'm talking to kids so <laughs> I discovered when I listened back to my recording. <laughs> okay folks uh I got a new volunteer for a vote of thanks tonight. Wall, would you like to come and say, uh, well, this is terrific, Sadie. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us and letting us speak as well. And thanks um, for the amazing questions and answers. That was fantastic. I love that. Yeah, we, we get a lot of um, intellectual and academic topics here, um, maybe about psychology or fish or engineering and all sorts of stuff. 
and a lot of it lives up here. But I think an awful lot of what you've been sharing with us and we've been sharing back comes from further mm. down. Mm. And um, I'd like to think that many of us will go home talking more about what we've been hearing because this is something we've all got a direct personal experience of. Um, I did a little bit of homework. I found a couple of episodes of your podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I found that on Spotify and uh, enjoyed that. I have to say, it's been even more fun having you here in person in the evening. Thank you. So I hope lots more people find your podcast and that takes off. And thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Thank you. Thank you.